Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce. Curdy, hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Oh, I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm a little frazzled, honestly, after like, it's like been very, a lot of, a lot of writing in recent yeah. days. <laughs> a, lot, uh, a lot of work, a lot of work. Just like anyone else who's following the NHL and all the fans who are glued to their Twitter accounts and social media trying to figure out. Um, I think that was the other's problem today, Bruce. They came out so flat against Columbus because they were all glued to Twitter all day just sitting there. Who's going to be traded? Who's going to their, their minds were not on the game and they came out with, you know, one in 10 games for most teams is a stinker. Well, this was that stinker for the orders. They lost. What was it? Four, one, three, four, two, four, two. Okay. Sorry. My bad. Yeah. They, that Perry got that goal. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been so distracted myself by all the trades that I'm uh, forgetting the game. It's already washed from my mind. Almost four, two for Good the orders. Idea. Four two for the Blue Jackets. For the Blue Jackets, <laughs> not for the Oilers, who got in a hole too deep to dig out of. They sure and did. Uh, frankly, I thought fully earned the zero points that they got from this game by being the second best team on the ice against Columbus, who had the jump on them most of the game. Really, I thought. Yeah, they all, the great A shots in the end were 15 to 10 for the Oilers, but a lot of that was um, the Oilers in the third period had a spurt where they had uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven great A shots in a row, many of them on the power play, four of them on the power play. So mm-hmm. if you take away that stretch right. where the Oilers are desperate to come back in the game, Columbus had the edge, and they mm-hmm. were the team that outworked and outplayed uh, tonight. The Oilers... Just didn't seem interested in in winning that game no. at any point, really, in the game. And um, it was a pathetic effort. Well, when there's 140 to go in the third period and you're trying to get your goalie out and the puck's in your end of the ice and the other team's winning all the races and puck battles. So at a certain point, I'm saying, if we're going to dial up the urgency, like maybe now <sighs> would be a good time. Never happened. It never, never happened in this up. game. They couldn't, uh, you know, I mean, on full credit to Columbus, they worked their asses off and they deserved to win this game and they won it. Uh, they but did. Edmonton's execution was piss poor and they deserved to lose this game and they lost it. Indeed. Bruce, uh, our two good things, two bad things, two numbers and one conundrum podcast. I think we'll spend a little more time on the conundrum stuff tonight than the game okay. itself. Let's just whip through this game, though. Stinker of a game. Yeah. What's your good thing? Yeah, my good thing is Chris Knobloch's decision to start Calvin Pickard in this game. Uh, and I think he got it bang on, and it was worth the risk of, you know, you, when you play your backup, you might, get, you know, give up a goal that your starter might not let in, and maybe Stu Skinner would have stole this game. Who knows? But my bigger concern is that at this point, and other stretches of the season where the schedule piles up, they have six games in nine days. Mm-hmm. Right, so it's obvious that Pickard's going to play in the two back-to-backs last <clears throat> weekend and this upcoming weekend. Mm-hmm. Less obvious was how they were going to split out the games Tuesday and Thursday. And if it had been uh, normal rotation, I would have guessed Pickard or sorry Skinner would have got both games. Yeah, and it would have been four games to two in nine days. And I thought that um, Knobloch correctly read the schedule and said this is a time to push the back up a little more and dial back a little I mean, they're still both going to play three games in nine days, which is plenty. But I, I thought this was tonight's game was going to be the test. And at this point now, I'm, I'm willing to, to predict, which is something I don't like doing, that uh, Skinner will start on Saturday and Pickard on Sunday in the two morning games on the weekend. And they'll just treat the six-game series, Skinner, Pickard, Skinner, Pickard, Skinner, Pickard. Right decision. Unfortunately, Pickard didn't have a great first period, and more unfortunately, neither did his teammates, and they fell into that three nothing hole. And he bounced back after and gave him a chance to fight back, but that hole was too deep. But as for Knobloch, I think he nailed it. That that, that was the right decision, and that wasn't necessarily an easy one. Completely agree. Uh, Bruce, 
You can't you can't play your starting goalie to death. You can't kill him. You can't kill the guy. <laughs> it's a really bad idea. They're going to need yeah. Stuart Skinner sharp for the playoffs. So good work. My yeah, good thing, Bruce, so uh, was the one. Well, there was you know they did score two goals. So there was two kind of rays of light in this mm-hmm. game, but the first goal was particularly uh, fantastic play and one of the few fantastic plays. Starts with Evan Bouchard in his own end, and he absolutely rips a long pass up the ice. He had his moments of disgrace in this game, turning over the puck. Oh. But um, I, I am noticing, Bruce, that he is skating. He is skating a lot better than he ever did before. He is really moving well with the puck um, and making plays with the puck. And this was an occasion. He just it was an angle pass tr- um, from his own, deep in his own zone to dry saddle at the opposition blue line. And Leon... Um, then whips a backhand pass, I think it was, to the center of the ice. And McDavid makes this incredibly clever play where he turns his leg and directs the pass from his leg. He can't get it to it otherwise. He directs it with his leg. Um, I don't think it hit his skate, but I think it hit his leg. And um, over to Zach Hyman, who absolutely slammed it into the net. Bruce, I haven't seen a play, a goal that lovely since, uh, you know, um, uh, Busquets, Iniesta, Xavi, and Messi combined for Barcelona, <laughs> and and then this one it was it was uh, McDavid Tippy playing tacky. the role of Xavi or Iniesta, who always just made those great quick passes, mm-hmm. you know, deflected pass, you know, just a turn of the foot, and it's in the right spot, and it's in the net, and uh, it it was a beautiful goal, and uh, in an ugly game. I love that Barcelona team. I used to watch the Champions League. This was back when TSN used to actually have soccer rights. And they showed the Champions League on Tuesday and Wednesday. And yeah. I watched more of those games than I watched any other soccer. And, and uh, I became a mammoth fan of Barcelona just based on how they played. I just loved their style of play. And uh, they, uh, they scored an awful lot of pretty goals on four-way passing plays, occasionally 11-way passing plays. <laughs> well, 30-way. Like, they would well, hold 30 the ball passes, forever. passes, yeah. Yeah, there'd be 30 yeah. passes. It's, yeah, it was incredible. would touch it at least once, and uh, and the goal scorer would tap it in from the far post. <laughs> you know what always gets me in, in European football, Bruce, is it's um, – and it's funny because hockey's not like this, but there's always, in, including the announcers – the cameras, the announcers, everyone, it always goes to the goal scorer. Even if he just had a one touch of the ball and and it went in the net. There might have been some guy who made this tremendous play in the midfield mm-hmm. and deked out two or three guys and then laid the ball perfectly, you know, across and the and the guy heads it in. Mm-hmm. It's they just they don't mention it. Like in, in hockey, and it might be, I don't know why this is, and it just might maybe because just, we give assists. Maybe because, or it, could it be as simple as we, we've created a statistic, so now we focus on that statistic. They have a, also have assists in soccer, but they give North, them up quite sparingly. North American Soccer League, they do give out one. And they, for, do, in, they do in they do in the Premier League, yeah, too, but it's... Yeah. They, it's but they don't but talk they don't about always, it a lot, right. They don't talk about it, and they, and they, never, they never highlight that. Like, they, it's mm-hmm. always the guy... I guess it's just so rare. It's much more rare to score in football than it is... Than it is in hockey. Even it's about twice this, you know, half as many goals. I guess. So maybe it is just such a miraculous thing to ever score that that's what you care about. But it's it's just such an obsession there. Whereas here, I think we I think we get it right. I think that often the great play is the is the player who creates. And um, I, I like the fact there's two assists. Actually, I think it's a very effective way and has been over time a very effective, durable, fair and accurate way over time for the NHL to measure offensive performance. You don't really need anything else um, over even, you know, over a full season, you, you know, might, there might be a few, a handful of players who have kind of distorted high or low numbers, but generally speaking, it's a pretty good indicator of offensive talent. Anyway, I don't know how I got yeah. off on that tangent, well, but I did. In soccer, they'll focus on the goal scorer and the after goal, whereas uh, here in North America in hockey, uh, the focus after a goal immediately turns to the coach of the team that's just been scored upon. They do it every <laughs> single time. Zoom in on the coach on the bench, chewing his cud and trying not to swear. You know? <clears throat> uh, how oh, much well, you're, uh, come on. Often they'll zoom in on the player who made the mistake. 
Well, like if it's a goal against yeah, the Oilers, they always there. they always try to pick out some player who made a mistake. I find like they do that too, which I'm okay with. Like the player did yeah. make a mistake, so. Well, there's certainly big mistakes made on the goals against tonight, now, wasn't there? Yeah. So. Why don't I start this? Because because sure. we're going in order of the goals. So my bad thing is the first goal against. And okay, Vinny DeHarnay is going to stick in the top pairing, Bruce. He can't. He just can't make plays like this. He switched on the play. Um, I think there's a battle on the boards, high in the owners' end, and Vinny has switched with Darnell Nurse. They switch sides. And the puck gets pushed into the corner behind Vinny. And Vinny, he's switched with Darnell Nurse. He's got to go get the puck. That's his side of the ice now. He's got to go get it. Instead, he either he hesitates or he defers. I'm not, or he thinks Nurse is a better puck carrier. He should get it. But Darnell Nurse is waiting for him to get it and covering in front of the net like he should be doing. Anyways, DeHarnay signals for Nurse to go get it. And, and it looks... Like when you're watching the play the first time, you think, why is Nurse so bloody slow on that play? Like, why did he, you know, why did he lose that obvious, that battle to go get the puck? He could have got it. But it's because of this hesitation by, from Dar- DeHarnay, who should have got it and tells Nurse to go get it. And by then, the, oh. the Columbus player is in there and Nurse doesn't really have a play. So then, then Vinny makes a second mistake. He's, he's, he's moving over to his spot, but he's left the high slot wide open. His player in the high slot is left wide open as the pass comes. It goes up the boards and then from the player on the boards into the middle of the ice. That's DeHarnay's check, and he's no, he's nowhere close to it. He's got to make that play, and he's nowhere close. So it's, it's because of his initial hesitation that this whole sequence of pain unfolds. And he is a – listen, he has improved, 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 improved. And perhaps if we're patient, people like me – he will improve enough to earn a spot in the top four and to do a good job there. And this will be, this is one of the moments that he will be learning from, I will suggest. Hope so. Yeah, the shot also went right through his skates. Yeah. Because uh, he was, you know, he wasn't close enough to block it and the guy picked the picked the hole and yeah. put it in there. He was uh, my son who's a uh, like Vinny, a lumbering uh, right shot defenseman in his day <laughs> said the play there he says because Vinny was the right defenseman he probably shouldn't be going into the left corner and I said from from as I was seeing there D1 and D2 and uh, D1 is the guy closest to the play and that was DeHarnay even though it was the left side they should switch there and leave Darnell to cover the front of the net which is clearly what Darnell was expecting because by the time he went for the puck it was sort of that split second delay and David I would suggest that on that goal and the second goal uh, that a big part of the problem was communication between new deep pairings between DeHarnay and uh, Nurse there, and on the CC uh, uh, Kulak dead pass to Kulak play, where maybe if they're you know a little more used to each other, they execute that play a little cleaner, uh, which wasn't the only thing that went wrong there, but it was a big part of it. Well, go and, ahead, Bruce. You're, let's yeah, move on I'm, I'm there already. So yeah. this was one where my my bad thing is actually a whole so, well, let's call it a minute of pain. Uh, especially for um, Calvin Pickard. And it included the second and the third goal, but before that, it included a wicked slash by Boone Jenner on the arm wrist of uh, of, um, of Pickard after he caught and saved sort of the first grade A shot that he faced in this rapid succession. Should have been a was, penalty burst. This was, yeah, absolutely. He hacked him hard. Yeah. Like that would be a slashing penalty on anybody. I can't believe he didn't call that. Anyway, <clears throat> they didn't call it, and this was after he'd made a save after all of McDavid, uh, Ekholm, and Bouchard got beaten out of the corner, and the puck went into the slot, and it was Goudreau, I think, that shot the backhand shot, and uh, Pickard gloved it, and Jenner carved him. And Pickard was pretty upset. Maybe he got rattled. I don't know. Uh, I do know that they scored 25 seconds later and then another 29 seconds after that. And the first one, again, I kind of, I mean, I'm biased, but I kind of thought it was a missed call on the icing 
I okay, he rifled the puck down and CC reached for it, but he didn't touch it. And the rule isn't that if he's near it, if they wave it off, the rule is, he's, you know, if it's a hard icing play, you're supposed to, you know, deflect it. And he didn't. Anyway, the linesman decided to wave that off. And CC was, I think, expecting the call. And he lumbered behind the net to get the puck. And, and Columbus did what they did all night, was skate harder and faster with more purpose than the Oilers. And the guy was on CC, and he tried to get out of it by making a cute little wall pass, one foot bounce pass to Kulak, and he, he just put it behind him. Like Kulak's route was different than CC's past him. Again, I say, partly that's just guys that aren't used to playing together. But anyway, the puck went from there to um, the uh, second. Um, Blue Jacket getting the puck behind the net and passing it out in front of the third Blue Jacket. It was completely uncovered uh, because uh, I think the order forwards also thought it was icing and both Adam Henrique and Corey Perry just sort of coasted off to the bench. No, that while, was a different play, Bruce. While they iced it. Wasn't that the one where they... Uh, no, that was a different... That was a, oh, that was... no, this is, a, this is the... Uh, where, where the hell was that? That's okay. three minutes earlier. Where oh, okay. Perry and Henry go oh, off from the cloud. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Different different play. Anyway, sure nobody, our score sheet nobody in front was of me. back and recovering like on this on this icing play. And where were the forwards? I don't know. Anyway, the defense. Well, they all thought it was gonna be icing, done. Bruce. They yeah, all thought so. it was gonna be icing. Kulak thought it, Cece thought yeah. it, and they all thought it because it was icing. Yeah, and Pickard probably thought it too. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm gonna give a little bit, bit of the blame, so let's say ninety-five percent of it to the linesman. <laughs> 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 but the other five percent can be blamed on the guys that did not play to the whistle yeah, and did not execute when they it's got more like there. It's more like 100% of the call was the linesman's <laughs> fault than 100% of the mistakes were CC and Kulak's fault. Oh, that's fair. That's fair. It was <laughs> two different things, but uh, they did not play to the whistle and they they got burned. And then they had a, a face-off at center ice and a big fight with uh, newcomer Sam Carrick going at it with a very tough guy, uh, uh, Olivier. Uh, yeah. What's his first name? Matthew Olivier for... Uh, 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 Columbus, same guy that gave the black eye to that uh, uh, big hot shot on the Rangers last week. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that guy. Ranky? Ranky? I don't know what's his name. Sorry, so I close to that. Uh, anyway, he, he, he uh, he's a tough guy, and I, I'm not sure what Carrick was doing there. Anyway, he got a couple in, but uh, uh, Columbus maintained the momentum. And again, Edmonton... You know, at a point in the game where they need to sort of stabilize, and this time it's Warren Fogel, who has the puck in his own zone about six feet inside the blue line on the right side, and for whatever reason, he tries to hit Darnell Nurse with a full cross-ice pass inside of his own zone. Of course, it never gets to Nurse, plus Nurse is now out of the play, and the Columbus guy picks it off, cruises right up the middle, essentially a two-on-one, and he wires a shot from the high slot that goes under Pickard's armpit and through the, I can't remember if it's a six or seven hole, that uh, that one went in. And that one was certainly partially on Pickard, and mostly I, I thought it was on Fogel. I thought, to me, it was a grade-A shot, and, the, you know, the turnover was the thing. Anyway, it was poor, poorly played. And just like that, uh, I mean... Jenner should still be in the penalty box at this point, right? <laughs> <laughs> the score has gone from one nothing to 3 nothing, And that was a hockey game, right? They already spent the next 45 minutes gradually scratching back to 3-2. Uh -huh. uh, even then, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that they carried the play all that much, but uh, uh, they certainly, uh, you know, they made, they made a game out of it. But uh, uh, that... 54 seconds of pain was really the the part of the game where this one got decided. Wasn't good, that's for sure. Yeah, Calvin Pickard. Uh, I thought he, I thought he had it was a listen. He had time he to was pick good a shot after that, but he that on um, he should have. I thought he should. It was a high enough shot. Mm -hmm. It just went through him. It just got through him. It's one mm -hmm. of those shots. It just got through him. So 
It happens. It's a great A that should have been stopped and wasn't, but it's still, you know, the guy got a real hard shot with the off passing option, and the goalie was sort of barely prepared for it because the puck was going. Well, he on was on one second. Well, no, he was, was. Well, if you watch, I think if you watch Picker, he's well out. He's well out to cut down the angle. He's in the right position. It just just it, got underneath him. He, yeah, he thought just, he was just blocker him. side, and it, he, anyway. Yeah, yeah, that is a horrible sequence. Ghastly. What's like your number? Three nothing. Oh yeah, yeah. we're still What's on me, right? What's your number? Now, okay, I'm going to go with a hundred. That's okay. my number, and that is the number mm. of, of course, uh, points. Now the Connor McDavid has after that uh, messy pass on the uh, uh, Hyman goal. It was kind of a messy game when you think about it. Uh, and anyways, uh, with that, he got to the hundred point milestone for the seventh time in his career. This pulled him into a tie with Mike Bossy and Peter Stastny for fourth all time for 100 point seasons. <clears throat> with, uh, of course, uh, uh, the one and only Wayne Gretzky out in front with 15 such seasons, 15 100 point seasons. Mary Lemieux, 10. Marcel Dion, 8. And now we got uh, McDavid, Bossy, Stastny in there. And McDavid broke out of an 11-way pass uh, tie for, <laughs> for what had been sixth with quickly the names Orr, Howard, Chuck, Curry, Lafleur, Esposito, Trache, Crosby, Sackick, Eisenman, Messier. And you'll notice that all of those names are from mostly the 1980s and certainly yeah. from the 20th century with the lone exception of Sidney Crosby, who's six, which is very impressive. But McDavid, who's 10 years younger, has already got to seven and climbing up the list. He won't catch Gretzky because no he, one ever does on this uh, kind of records. But I don't know, Bruce. I don't he, know. He's he got a slight more? chance. He's got a uh, slight uh, I, Yeah, yeah. He'd, be, he'd have to do that till he's, what, 35, 36? No, I think he's got a chance if he stays healthy. If he got eight more in a row, he'd be 35, and that would get him to a tie with Gretzky. Like I, yeah. I'm, I'm saying doubtful. Yeah. And by the way, he became uh, uh, joined a select list of guys with 75 assists in the season. Wayne Gretzky 15 times again, Lemieux seven, or Coffee and Oates with five, and McDavid tied with. Uh, Esposito and Howard Chuck with four. So again, story names from the past. And yes. here's a guy in the 21st century who's climbing the list. And that's what impresses me the most. It is impressive. It's always hard to, without adjusting for eras, yeah. compare points because it, like you, mm -hmm. we're, it's hard you're automatically lifting anyone before the 1970s because right. they only played between 30 and and 70, 70 games, games. Mm -hmm. um, a season. And most, you know, you know, they played 30, then 40, then 50, then 60, and then they gradually mm -hmm. worked their way way up to 82. And, th and there was also dead puck arrows in there when it was much harder to score. Looks like um, we're heading to another one right now where it's getting a little harder to score, isn't it? The goalies are making more saves. Uh, Bruce, my number also involves Connor McDavid, but not in a good way. And... Um, <laughs> I just, I just think it spoke to the lack of focus in this game. But his shifts, there's four consecutive Connor McDavid shifts in the third period. So, of course, you want him on the ice, and he might stay out a little longer for his shifts, right, in the third period. I think Connor McDavid's sh average shift length this year is about a minute per shift. It was tonight, too. Um, but those four shifts in a row, his first shift was 139. That was all even strength. Second shift, 143, all even strength. Next shift, 239, most of it on the power play. I think maybe all of it on the power play. And then the next shift, 151. Bruce, four Connor McDavid, row. four in a row. Connor McDavid in the mi first minute of his shift is the best player in the world. But mm -hmm. every 10 seconds, he stays on the ice after that. He goes from best player to a really good, to an all-star, to a really good player, to a good, to a mediocre player. You know, after about a minute 40, yeah. he's not a good player anymore. And it's, it's it again, that's not disciplined hockey. And he, he, know, he knows that, I think, and he shouldn't do that. 
even in a game where there and there's always extend there's often extenuating circumstances like something happens there's an icing or there's this or that happening um to prevent a shift change so there is that going on but nonetheless those the four shifts in a row at, of that length is a little bit extreme yes it is and it, this it wasn't like he was creating a whole lot either in this game it didn't seem like i, I don't know how many grade a's we've got him down for but it wasn't like every shift they were creating a great chance and coming close those chances were it seemed like they were relatively there was there was full shifts where there weren't any chances let's put it that way and and long ones but well on those four shifts bruce mm -hmm. he he was in on three grade eight chances all in the power on play the power all in the play. power play so none of the none of the three even strength shifts that were so long did he create any five, any... five minutes worth of shifts yeah so, them if you um, them yeah indeed so not as <laughs> not his best moment this year he's had many you know what and and again every team is going to have stinker games every mm -hmm. player is going to have yep. every player is going to have some real super stinker games and stinker moments in games it's just part of hockey it's not a big deal but um they they don't they they learn from them and they don't have them as much so yeah well to follow up in the first period when it was three nothing and they were going not anywhere and i said <clears throat> the worst part about this is they'll probably use mcdavid for 24 minutes to try and get back into the games when i said to my son and they wound up using him for 24 minutes and 16 seconds tonight you know thursday night loss at columbus and you know just deficit from the energy bank and now they have games on saturday morning and sunday morning and well, they're they're in the afternoon in the states, right? Are they? Uh, yeah, I guess in local time. Anyway, they're yeah. they go off of their local clock. They're plenty early, and of course the clock jumps ahead on Saturday night, which doesn't help either. But um, it's this is where not coming out and and taking command of this game early. This is a game you want to win by rolling four lines and just being better than the other guys. And if you look at the standings, the orders are better than the other guys. If you watch the hockey game, they weren't. So, but I would I would like to have seen the lines roll a little bit more, and that, that those two minute shifts that uh, that can't be. Who does he think he is, Phil Esposito? <laughs> Did Henri Richard used to have three minute shifts? <laughs> I think someone was complaining. I remember Esposito reading. Esposito was the, was sort of the famous one for rolling through three sets of wingers on one shift. <laughs> uh, I can never say a bad word about Phil Esposito after a certain hockey series in 1972, Bruce. I will not say a bad word about Phil. It's Esposito. Not a bad word. It's just a, it's just uh, <laughs> part of his. It's part of what he who he was. We used to say the same thing about Leon when he stayed out for more than one minute. Well. Espo might stay for three or four. <laughs> <laughs> Espo time. He was on his own watch. Yeah. All right. Um, Bruce, um, let's move on, on to our conundrum. And the conundrum question is, have the Oilers done enough at the training deadline? And I'll start it off with what Ken Holland said tonight on Oilers Now. Um, he said... If that's if we if if that's the case, he was asked. I think have you done enough? He says if that's the case, I'll I'll be happy with what we've done. Was his answer? He said to wake up uh, Friday morning and make a few calls and see if anything's up. But um, that's that was his last answer, which sounded to me an awful lot like probably they're done. Um, at the same time, there there have been uh, Frank Sarvalli has been pu uh, putting out rumors that if Jordan Eberle doesn't sign a contract extension in Seattle, um, maybe he's done that already. I don't know. Um, that um, as we're maybe as we're speaking, he's thinking it um, that Eberle might be traded. And then there's Alexander Carrier, who's also has to sign a contract. And I don't, mm -hmm. I haven't checked lately if he has. You have to check this every few minutes, of course. Right. Or you're caught out, but um, Carrier's a, a right shot puck movie defenseman from Nashville, and right. if he doesn't sign, they could move, Nashville could move him as well. So that's where we're at, and um, those are maybe the two calls that he's going to make. You know, uh, Everly's agent and Carrier's agent, how's it going? And 
he'll know then if there's more moves to be made. So Bruce, um, has he done enough? Let's say he is done at this point. Um, and, he, and he's assessed if he's done, he, he'll feel good about what he's done. What do you think? Has he done enough compared to the rival teams? Right. I was going to say, ask me in June. Uh, has he done <laughs> enough? Uh, well, he's he's done he's done quite a bit. Like he's changed out um, or added three players to his team of a you know twenty one or twenty two man roster. That's a fair little bit of turnover. Uh, the guy he got today, uh, Troy Stetcher, comes in doesn't really replace anybody, but he actually gives them a bona fide veteran seventh defenseman presence on the team. Uh, but yesterday, I mean, if, if and this morning, I guess effectively he moved out uh, both Sam Gagne and Dylan Holloway to make room for the two newcomers that he picked up in the same trade yesterday, uh, Alex, um, Adam Henrique and Sam Carrick. And all three guys he got are, you can need to understand why why they would go out and acquire them. They fill a need of different types, uh, with Henrique being, you know, obviously the plum of the guys they got and, you know, an accomplished veteran NHL forward, $6 million player that they got for 1.5 million, essentially. And he has the capacity to play center or wing, really, I would say second or third line, middle six. He's going to shore up the middle six somewhere. Uh, and he can also penalty kill and he can also power play, which uh, we'll, he'll be doing, I expect, from the second unit. Uh, but on the penalty kill, we didn't really see much of the penalty kill tonight because Edmonton only had one penalty in this game. Mm-hmm. And he uh, never saw the ice, Henrik. Uh, nor Carrick. Uh, Carrick had one shift to 27 seconds on the penalty kill. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're both face-off guys. They were both uh, 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 north of 50% tonight, uh, 4 of 6 for Henry, 4 of 7 for Carrick, a lefty, a righty. <clears throat> like it, he checked a lot of boxes with that trade. Both guys can play center or wing, meaning just more and more versatility uh, for Edmonton up front. So uh, that was... To get two players for one trade, mind you, first round draft pick, pay the pay the price for it, uh, but got their contracts bought down and into uh, an affordability range. Uh, today's pickup was Stetcher. Uh, I like the player. I, I've liked him for a long time. I even liked him when he played for Vancouver. It doesn't happen too often. And <laughs> he uh, he's a uh, small guy, but he's feisty as can be. And uh, and he uh, he's he plays a very courageous game. He goes where angels fear to tread, and you know on his puck retrievals and stuff. And he's a you know a darter, a good good skater, and uh, he's not going to score a million points, but he's kind of a uh, a, a right shot. Brett Kulak would that be a fair description? Someone compared of, him to Andrew Ference. Yeah, yeah, like that, a guy with a lot of battle in his, and who you just yeah, can't keep out of the lineup. That was Thomas Drance that uh, said that, I believe. Yeah, and I yeah. quoted him in the post I wrote this morning. <clears throat> and the guy, the Vancouver hockey writer Thomas yeah, Drance, right for the Athletic, yeah, yeah. I believe. Yeah, 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 and, and a very uh, astute hockey guy that I followed for a long, long time as an original blogger, and he's kind of moved his way up and into the uh, into the industry, but. Uh, uh, so each of the guys they got uh, fills something of a hole, but uh, there would be a lot of criticism out there, and I know there is a lot of criticism out there that some of the big holes have not been filled. There's no clear top six right winger, even though they've added a top six caliber forward. Uh, so, uh, But there's also nothing resembling a top four defenseman. Uh, that uh, uh, some have identified as Edmonton's biggest need, noting that the struggles of Cody Cece, who did not help his cause on that second goal tonight. Uh, anyway, uh, Jordan Schmaltz, who's the brother of uh, 
uh, Nick Schmaltz that plays for Arizona, and he's, in, he's himself a former player and, and insider in Arizona. He says, Troy Stetcher is a hell of a sneaky pickup for the Oilers. Dude is like 5'9", standing on a phone book. Plays like he's seven feet, heart of a lion and a fierce cont- competitor. <laughs> I love the move, Oilers fans. Watch him get back to pucks. He's first touch all day, no matter who is barreling down on him. So that was a, a player, and you know, I've been watching him this year. And Drant said, I see Troy Stetcher as being like a new, new NHL Andrew Ference. Because of his size, his teams always try to build up enough depth to push him down the lineup. Because he's good and a warrior, he always ends up playing a bigger role than the club intended. Really nice ad for Edmonton. So those were two really sort of ringing endorsements from people that seen him play quite a bit. So I always liked Stetcher in Vancouver, and I remember the first ta- first season when I saw him playing for Vancouver, I thought, "Geez, I wish the why can't the Orders find players like this?" Mm-hmm. Because he he just has a real. Um, he struck me as a really smart player who can move the puck well. And um, I don't know about his defending. I don't know. I haven't watched him. I can't say if these appraisals are correct or not. But I just have that strong impression of him as a decent player. Um, Bruce, I'm just going to quickly review kind of the in and the out for the top contending teams in the West. So Vegas mm-hmm. essentially didn't give up anything off their team right. this year. You know, they gave up a, some picks, including a first and a Mark second. Stone, Dave. Uh, yeah, now they've given up Alex Martinez to get more cap space. So they're going to do even more tomorrow. You can count is on he, it. Is he, did they actually L2? Yeah, I think so. Uh, oh, man. Sorry, Bruce. Yeah. Um, so they, they have given up nothing, and so far they have nothing this year off this year's team, the Futures. Um, they have brought in Noah Hannafin, who's probably a top-pairing defenseman, and Anthony Matha, a second-line winner. Um, the Avs have done even more off their, but they've given up more off their team this year. They've given up Bowen Byram, who I've always really liked, but again, I haven't seen this year, so I don't know if he's regressed or what's happening with him. So they gave up Bowen Byron and Ryan Johansson, who I understand was underwhelming this year. So down two players, but they gained four. Yakov Trenin I, and Brandon Duhame. I think they're both similar kind of aggressive lower line players. They also brought in Sean Walker, who was pretty highly regarded um, um, this year as kind of a smaller puck-moving defenseman who could defend. And Casey Middlestad, who's a slick forward who can score. He'll be their second-line center. So four players in, and one of them, maybe, I don't know if Walker will play in their top four, but he might, and Middlestad will be on their second line. Um, Dallas brought in Tanev, Calgary brought in Lindholm, Winnipeg brought in Monaghan. Um, uh, going out of Vancouver, the only player they gave up was Kuzmenko, who they didn't like and weren't playing much. Dallas didn't give up anyone who they're playing. Neither did the Oilers. They they all gave up futures. Each each one of those teams, except for Dallas, gave up a second, but everyone else, and including Winnipeg for Monaghan, gave up firsts. So the orders didn't give up anyone in the game, Stetcher, Henrik, and Carrick. So a fourth liner, grinder, a second line or third line, like someone in their top, a core 13, Henrik, I think yeah. it's fair to say. Yeah, and Stetcher, top seven forwards, I would say for sure. And Stetcher, who I wouldn't be surprised, move in to the lineup ahead of one of CC or DeHarnay, depending on how things go. I think that the, I still do think the orders, um, have a hole moving the puck. They need one more right shot D man who can really move the puck. And if CC doesn't step up in that regard, I think he's capable of it. He he may he might be a veteran who can raise his game and get a bit more active. Um, we'll see. But if he doesn't, Stetcher's there. And I think that's excellent to have that option. So I'm I like what the orders have done. I was hoping they could get um Alexander Carrier and I and I don't know the player like just just by reputation you know just by statistics and what people say of him but he's very highly regarded as a as a puck moving attacking defenseman um, and a smart hockey player so if the orders could still somehow get Carrier tomorrow that'd be in my eyes great mm-hmm. you know Jordan Eberle I'm not sure if he's what they need at forward honestly I don't I think they need to it's like they they need McLeod, Fogel, and Holloway. They're big, fast forwards to step up and be big, fast forwards who produce. They need Kane to do the same thing. They, 
they have lots of forwards though, and lots of guys who can score. And I mean, Everly is um, a strong scorer. He's a he's a top six scorer um, at even strength. But I I don't personally I and I know a lot of people are going to hate to hear this because he's revered by many in this town. But I don't think <laughs> he's at the top of the list of needs for the Edmonton Oilers, not and not actually near it. Henrique and another def- and a f- defenseman are what the Oilers needed, a good center and a good defenseman. Another winger, they've got lots of people they can play on the wing. So, what well, do you think? Well, of a natural the- right winger with, uh, you <clears> know, <throat> plus offense as a, both a playmaker and as a goal scorer. Uh, there's lots to like about uh, Everly's game. I'm, uh, having just watched him, I thought he had an absolutely great game against the Oilers on Saturday. And I thought, boy, that player could sure help the team. But, of course, guys well, don't have great games great. every game. But he yeah. sure had one that day. He had a puck on a string, and he was zipping it around. Uh, so, but in his case, I mean, he's at $5.5 million. And if you did a double retention job on uh, to get him, you're giving up, you know, more draft picks, probably at least a second to get him. And probably a fourth or fifth to get the retention and they uh, and that would get them down to 1.375 million and at the moment they don't have that much space so they basically what they have left at this moment in time is Dylan Holloway's you know they got roughly one million dollars is I understand I haven't got the new figure from Puckpedia but I bet it's not much different than that <clears throat> so, uh, so you think if the cost is too high, or might yeah, I, yeah, I'm possible. not sure they can bring the cost down enough. Well, I what guess if they, they, could, they could cut they, a player and, and like work C- it out Dumba, that way, or move out CC train. and then bring in Dumba as well, or you know, try to bring in another yeah, like yeah. bring another right shot guy. I, I just think it starts to be too many new players at some point as well. If they yeah. do that, well, that's like, Colorado's risk. Oh, mind yeah. you, they pulled it off in the past in 2022. They got a stack of new guys and they won the cup. So I guess. Joe Sackick's not too afraid of adding guys of four players is a lot. And, it, it, you know, it's that's 20% of your dressed yeah. roster if, they're, if yeah. they're all playing. So, you know, you're risking playing with the chemistry. <clears throat> On the other hand, Colorado got a, a whole lot tougher uh, in their bottom six with the addition of uh, Duheim and uh, who's the other fellow they got today? Yakov. Oh, Trennan, yeah. Yeah, Trennan. yeah they both, they're both close to 200 hits on the season. And they, you know, they bring physicality. That's what the Oilers got Carrick for. <clears throat> I was listening to the Jason Greger show this afternoon, and he pointed out that not one of the Oilers' bottom six forwards has as many <clears throat> as 70 hits on the season. And Carrick's got 137, like literally double. Fogel had 67, and he's sort of bottom six or that's played up the lineup a little bit but they got nobody on the bottom that really lays on the body and Oilers got one guy and Colorado got two guys and arguably the two guys they got might be you know slightly better players I can't say that for sure on the other hand I was told by someone who I can't name on the internet because I can't remember who it was. <laughs> uh, while uh, uh, Vegas was adding uh, uh, the big guy from Washington, uh, 39. Mantha. Anthony Mantha. And the Oilers were only getting um, uh, uh, Henrique. Henrique, Adam Henrique. And I looked up their stats for the last three years, and well, I'll look at uh, Mantha's played 160 games. He's got 40 goals and 44 assists, 84 points. And Henrique's played 180 games. He's got 59 goals and 122 points, like far ahead of the other guy. And yet, with the guys, you know, the grass is always greener over the septic tank, eh? And uh, uh, that guy, well, if, if Vegas wanted him, he must be good. Whereas if Oilers, if Oilers get the, you know, the, the leftovers that the other teams don't want, it's some of the attitude it seems that comes across at times. And Adam Henrique's a hell of a player. I, I don't think he really showed that much tonight. 
but I do think that um, uh, he brings he brings a lot of game and he's going to make his line better. And the orders need help in that you know second and or third line, uh, and that's uh, where he's going to deliver. It'll be interesting to see where he he lands because, like some people don't trust McLeod at third line center for the playoffs. I, I'm not in that camp. I do trust Me him neither. there, but I think he might be better on the wing in the top six. Um, Ryan McLeod, I think, if he gets going in the playoffs as a winger, could be uh, could make be a difference maker, a player who really comes to the fore in the playoffs. He just got everything it takes. He's big, he's fast, he's skilled. And mm. if he goes for it, man, he could be a load. If he, I, I just see the second line wingers as as pr- me, Fogel, and Carrick, or excuse me, Fogel and McLeod with, um, yeah. you know, Nuge in the middle probably. And, um, you know, it was interesting how quickly they went back to the dry saddle, Hyman, McDavid thing, Bruce. Even though your it sense, wasn't working. Even though it wasn't working, but your your yeah. sense, your argument for that line, I think, is irresistible at this point. I think that we will see that line. And then I, we'll probably see Henrik leading the third line. And... Um, that's that's good for me. It's nice to have a player like Adam Henrique as your third line center. Ryan McLeod was one who <clears throat> was feeling it tonight. He was flying out there, skating. He was like at the top of his skating game, which is yeah. considerable. And he he was uh, just racing around out there and uh, and bringing the puck with him a lot of the time. So Connor Brown sat out. Mm-hmm. And yep. uh, you know the only the only move I I don't and I I mean I don't object to any of them but the only the only one I think that I question a bit in turn in hockey terms Sam Gagne has he, he he finally had a really good game he was back to his self that he had been in the fall when he first came here after his injury he when he's played well this year Sam Gagne has been a really good winger he's been a oh, good to really good winger yeah. and I don't see. Like, I understand why they did it, because they can't wave the other guys. They're going to probably be claimed. You don't want to take a chance losing Connor Brown, and people don't want to hear that. But, man, it's not justice for Sam Gagne, because he, by performance, he's outplayed almost, you know, every other Oilers winger not named um, Warren Fogel, Zach Hyman, and Leon Dreisaitl, if you include Dreisaitl as a winger at this point. Sam Gagne, has had a, he has been a strong player. So... He's been better than Corey Perry. He's been Kane's better than Kane. Twenty-one goals. You think I, Gagne's uh, been better than Kane? I do. I think mm-hmm. if Kane, Gagne played more, he'd have more goals too. I mean, how many more? How many more minutes does Kane have than Gagne? Like twice as many, three times as many. Well, he's got four times as many goals. Kane does have a lot of goals, but, but Kane has been well, a liability defensively in a way. Kane has. His, he certainly has his issues on the defensive side. Yeah. Uh, anyway, they're. Uh, uh, as a two-way player, yeah, I Kane is Kane scored like he he has been scoring. I'll give him that, but like he has not been fantastic. Not lately. <laughs> no, he he's eight, eight games without a goal now. And well, he was yeah. around it. He's been around it the last two or three games, but he's not. He did get an assist tonight. You know, and he fired away, and Perry tipped it home. If I'm not so mistaken, there, their even strength point scoring per. Um. 60 minutes is the same. They're similar between Kane and Gagne this year. Kane's played 932, even strength minutes. Gagne's played 257. So a a third to a fourth as many minutes. All right, Bruce. Um, Well, we'll see what happens tomorrow. So what's our answer? Did they do enough or is he still, he's got enough for uh, one move tomorrow, but a good little move. Yes or no. (laughs) I've got this from my friend Wheaton Oil, who's a great follow on Twitter. Uh, Wheaton Oil uh, posits this scenario. He's got Holland, Colin, and he's, he's, he's imagining what Holland's doing tonight. And Well, gentlemen, I think we're done. Then in brackets, stretches out, pours a whiskey, watches the first period. Well, F-bomb. <laughs> 
that's a full trade. Maybe we're not. Yeah, because they interviewed, you know, they interviewed Maybe we're Holland done after in a the different first way. Movie. Did you see that? Did they interview. No, I did, I was doing. I saw he was yeah. on, but I was doing scoring chances. I mean, yeah, I need to go I back to it. What did he say? What did he say? Nothing. He didn't say anything. <laughs> um, Breaking. Anyway, yeah. Well, I don't think he'd put much weight in this game, but um, right. it, it, that's a good joke. Yeah, I I just oh. think um. You know, you're right, Bruce. They will know in June. Right now, I I if I just think what he wanted most that right shot defenseman who can move the puck wasn't there the market was it was glutted with forwards there's all kinds of forwards in fact they could probably pick up a forward a decent forward for fairly cheap tomorrow you know that's that's the reality but there's not the defense market is just empty you know tanev tanev was the top guy who's the next guy then who's the next guy after tanev walker well that walker and I he, guess went so. for, People like he went for a first round pick. So did Tanev. And 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 there wasn't there wasn't much after them. Like the 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 right shot D man. I I hadn't picked um Stetcher, uh, Stetcher out. No. Uh, to the degree I like I said last night on our podcast, I was hundred percent convinced that Holland would trade for a seventh D man. That would be probably be a right shot. And it would, you know, and they got um uh I was wasn't thinking in terms of stature, but he, he fits up Bill very nicely. The only thing he doesn't have is size, but apparently he has the heart of the lion, so that'll that'll work instead. He better five <laughs> foot eight or whatever he is. Five NHL foot nine defense. standing on a phone book. Yeah. <laughs> With his skates on. Yeah. So you know, I I like that oh. pickup a lot because mm-hmm. they were talking about bring, bringing in another big Bobby Clobber, right? Like oh. the names were Joel Edmondson, Josh Brown, and. When they got Stetcher, I thought, "Oh, that's I like." Brown that. was the other name out there, and yeah, that that's uh, thanks. But that's what thanks. I like to see was them. Th- they were thinking along the lines that you and I were thinking. Mm-hmm. You know, I think I, you know, we were. I saw that as a need. They got to get better moving the puck. You can't. CC yeah. and Deharney are below average puck movers for NHL defensemen. It's a big hole on the right side, and. If you can fix it, fix it. And I think they were trying to, but I don't think they could. So they thought, okay, our next biggest need, we need another center because we're going to play right. Leon and Connor together probably. We need another center. And they got the best center on the market, I think. Did they not? Was there a better pretty, center? Pretty good chance. I mean, he's 34 years old, but he's been bringing it at the sort of same I guess level Monaghan for a long, long be, time. Who's the competition that yeah, got traded? Lindholm and Monaghan that got traded. Oh, I guess ago. Lindholm. It's Lindholm on the wing or at center in Vancouver. Or in the doghouse. Yeah. <laughs> Last I heard, they were thinking of trading him off to get uh, exactly some guy from the Eastern yeah. Conference. Well, there you go. So, it, so that was for um, Gensel, who did get Gensel. traded tonight to uh, Carolina. Carolina. So he's safely right. stowed in the East. Thank uh, Gensel. He's, he didn't go to Vegas. Well, Vegas may get Bushnevich tomorrow, Bruce. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Don't, don't. Uh, or to Foley, we'll see what happens. Vancouver could get Tyler to Foley tomorrow. The owners could get Tyler to Foley tomorrow. Uh, but to Foley, he, so he's got an, uh, he's another guy with an expiring contract. They're going to look to move him. So, because right. uh, they're not going to be signing him. So it'll be interesting with, with Carrier and to Foley and Everly. There, there could be some action tomorrow. So maybe we'll be doing another podcast then. Yep. Deadline's at 1 p.m. Mountain tomorrow. Indeed. And All right, then hockey games Saturday morning and Sunday morning. We've been working mornings all week, David. I'm not used to this. Uh, I'm used to working really nights. busy. Yeah. <laughs> thanks so, for talking tonight, Bruce. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. <laughs>